Now, friends, we come to one of the most remarkable little epistles that there is in the Scripture. Little epistle of Philemon. Only one chapter. You'll have trouble finding it. But if you can find Titus, then just keep going. And if you find Hebrews, you've gone too far. Back up, there's Philemon. And it's a very wonderful little epistle, by the way. And the epistles, as we said at the beginning, way back when we were studying Romans, that's a new form of revelation. But even among the epistles, there are different kinds of epistles, by the way. God, for instance, in the past, he's used law, history, poetry, prophecy, the Gospels. Then he used the epistles. But in the epistles, some of them are directed to churches. Some of them are directed to individuals. Some of them are very personal. I frankly believe that Paul, when he wrote Philemon, didn't believe he was going to have this included in the canon of Scripture. So personal. I think that he'd be a little embarrassed. And I feel like when I'm reading Philemon, I'm looking over the shoulder of a man by the name of Philemon, reading his personal mail, by the way. Paul wrote this to him personally, but the Spirit of God has included it. Now, back of this is a story, of course. This man, Philemon, he lived in a place called Colossae. It's way up in the Phrygian country, in the Anatolian section of Turkey today. However, it's no city there today. It's just ruins. But it was a great city in that day. And in fact, Paul wrote a letter there. As far as we know, Paul didn't go there. But I have a notion there are a lot of things we don't know. And I'm of the opinion Paul did visit Colossae. But be that as it may, there was this very rich man in Colossae that had been saved, Uh, apparently had come down to Ephesus. And Paul, you remember, there for two years while he was speaking in the school of Tyrannus every day. And people were coming in from all over that area. There were millions of people in that area. And this is just one of the men that came to know the Lord Jesus. Now, he owned slaves, and he had a slave by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus took a chance one day, as any slave would have done, and he made a run for it. And he did what most slaves apparently in that day did. He moved into a great metropolis. And this slave made it all the way to Rome. And in that great population there, he could be buried, as it were, and not recognized. And one day, this man Onesimus, who'd been a slave, He found out that there was a slavery in freedom, and there was a freedom in slavery. You know, when he was a slave, he didn't worry about where he's going to sleep or what he's going to eat. His master had to take care of that. Now he has a real problem, and he's over in Rome. I think he's homesick and maybe hungry. He's going down the street one day, and there's a group of people gathered around listening to a man talk. And this man... Onesimus, he wormed his way into the crowd, got up front, and he saw the man was in chains. And now he'd run away from chains, and he thought he was free. But when he listened to that man, by the way, his name was Paul, he listened to him preach, and I want you to know that he said, well, that man's free, and I'm still a slave, a slave to appetite, slave to the economy. I'm still a slave, but that man's free. That man that was in chains, he waited till everybody drifted away after he'd given a message. And then he came up to him, and he wanted to know more about what he's talking about. And Paul led him to Christ. And I mean by that, he presented the gospel to him, told him how Jesus died for him, and how he was buried, raised again the third day, and that all he had to do was trust Christ. And he did. And then he did what any man that's been converted, he thinks back upon his past life and things that are wrong, he wants to make right. And he said, Paul, it's something I have to confess to you. I'm a runaway slave. Paul says, where'd you come from? Well, he said, I came from over to Asia Minor. Well, he says, what city? He says, Colossae. Paul says, there's a church over there. Well, he said, who was your master? Well, he says, my master was Philemon. 
He says, you mean Philemon that lives on Main Street? And Onesimus said, yes. Paul says, well, he's one of my converts also. He owes me a great deal. And Onesimus says, should I go back to him? And Paul says, yes, you should. And you can't get anything far against slavery in this epistle. You get a freedom that's above all the slavery of this world. We talk about freedom all we want to today. There are right now 10 million Americans that are slaves to alcohol. <laughs> They're not free. They're alcoholics. There are those that are slaves to drugs. There are those that are slaves to the economy. There are those that are slaves to the almighty dollar. Only the dollar's not so almighty. But we're living in a day when people think they're free. But the Lord Jesus said, if the Son make you free, you're going to be free indeed. And so he said, Onesimus, you'll have to go back, but you're going to go back differently. I'm going to send a letter with you. This is the letter that we have. Now, will you listen to it? And I'm going to read now, beginning with verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to pause there for just a moment because it's rather important to note this. Paul does not use the fact that he is an apostle. You see, when he's writing to a church, he gave his official title. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. But now this is personal, to a personal friend. He doesn't have to defend his apostleship, but he now can be very personal. And this is one of the reasons I think that he didn't want to let you in on this. I don't think he intended to broadcast this worldwide, but it's been. He said, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And I've noticed that several of the commentaries try to change this and explain it away, something like this. They say, well, now, what Paul really meant here was that he was a prisoner because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's not what Paul said. And Paul always had the ability to say exactly what he had in mind. And he's using a very flexible, versatile language, the Greek language. And he says he's a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And I think if you'd been there and gone up to him and said, Poor Paul, it's too bad these Romans put you in jail. Paul says, They didn't put me in jail. Oh, we would have said, We know what you mean. Those mean old religious rulers there, they brought a charge against you. Paul said, they didn't put me in jail. We would have said, then who put you in jail? He said, Jesus Christ, I'm his prisoner. And you mean to tell me you would serve somebody to put you in prison? He said, yes. He says, when it's his will for me to be in prison, I'm in prison. When it's his will for me to be out of prison, I'll be out of prison. When it's his will for me to be sick, I'm going to be sick. I belong to him. And since I belong to him, then in whatever state I am, I learn to be content. Everything's all right. Don't worry about me. That's the thought here. And Philemon, by the way, is one of the prison epistles, as you see. It goes along with Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. Philemon is the fourth one. Now he says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, the brother. And that means he's not only Philemon's brother, Paul's brother, but he's your brother, friends, if you're a Christian. Brothers in Christ, under Philemon, our dearly beloved. Paul really is, somebody says he's buttering him up, isn't he? I think so. He loved this man. He's going to make a request of him. And he's going to get to that. Now, will you notice? And he says, and to our beloved a fire, and that apparently was the wife of this man. And this man, Philemon, has a Greek name. Apparently, he was a citizen of Colossae. And there's a tradition up there that involves a Philemon. Not this man, of course, but he apparently was named for it. It's a Greek name. But this word of fire, that's a Phrygian name. I don't know whether that tells you anything or not, but that tells me that a young businessman by the name of Philemon he went into a new territory, if you please. He didn't go west, he went east. And he went to the city of Colossae, way up there on the frontier. Got in business, became a wealthy man. Met a Phrygian girl huh, by the name of Aphia, and he married her. And they both now become Christians. Isn't that lovely? And to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, they had a son, our fellow soldier. 
not a soldier of the Roman army, but a soldier in the army of Jesus Christ. Because you remember Paul had said that we are to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And to the church in thy house. Now, this man not only converted at a church in his house. I'd like to talk to you about that. Did you know the church building today has become so all-important to people that it's all out of relationship to really the purpose of the local church? Now, the local church in that day wasn't down on the corner in a separate building. In fact, the matter is, they didn't have any building. Now, there were great temples of pagan gods, but the early church didn't have that met in homes. It's estimated for 200 years the church met in homes. Then when they started building these great cathedrals of the past, the cathedrals were never meant for public meetings. These great cathedrals that you have in England, for instance, Westminster Abbey, for instance, that was never intended for to have public services in there. It was just built in the shape of a cross as a monument to Jesus Christ. I think they had the wrong idea. Instead of spending all that money on a cathedral, they should have sent missionaries out. But that was their way of expressing it. Frankly, this idea of putting all the emphasis on a building today and a building program is just a little out of line. The church in thy house, that's where they met. And then verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that's Paul's formal and usual greeting to every person and every church he wrote to. Now, verse 4, he's beginning now to move down, and I want you to listen to him. I love the way Paul wrote this. I think Paul's a little embarrassed that we're reading this today, friends, but let's read on. He says, I thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. Here's a man Paul prayed for, and you can put him on Paul's prayer list. Paul prayed for him. And the thought here is that every time his name was mentioned, why, he prayed for him. And apparently Philemon is rather prominent. And he says, "...hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints." Isn't that a lovely way he has of expressing. The life of Philemon was a testimony. And if you'll notice what he says here, his love was toward the Lord Jesus and toward other believers. His faith was toward the Lord Jesus, and he was faithful to other believers. That's interesting. Verse 6, that the fellowship of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The life of Philemon was a testimony. Verse 7, For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the hearts of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. In other words, Paul had great joy and consolation in the love of Philemon for other believers and for him. I've said this before across this land today. There are many wonderful Christians that I've had the privilege of meeting and being in their homes and having fellowship with them. And that's been one of the greatest joy of my ministry now as I not only broadcast but hold conferences just to meet some wonderful people today. And Philemon, if I'd gone there, I think he'd have entertained me in his home. He was a marvelous individual. Verse 8, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is fitting. Now, my friend, Paul is making a gracious plea for Onesimus. He's come to the purpose of the letter, and he approaches his subject diplomatically and cautiously, lovingly, but he's going to approach it. Will you listen to him? Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ, to enjoin thee that which is fitting. Now, on a threefold basis, he's going to make this request. Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech thee, your love and mine, for each other's believers. Number two, being such a one as Paul the age. Paul really was just in his sixties, but he was an old man. He'd suffered, you see. 
He says, I'm an old man, and you know that, Philemon. And third, now, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He tells it to us again. Because of these threefold things, and I can't come and talk to you personally, I beseech thee for my son. His son? Well, we've seen Timothy and Titus. Paul had a lot of sons, not married. Say, that looks bad, doesn't it? He's a spiritual son. He led Onesimus to the Lord. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. Now, he says, he belongs to you, though, who in time past was to thee unprofitable. Now, Onesimus means profitable. And Paul really has a play on words here that's tremendous. He was good at that, by the way. But now profitable to thee and to me. And it would be like this. His name means profitable. Paul says, when you had profitable, you didn't have profitable. Now that you don't have profitable, you do have profitable. You see, as a slave, he wasn't much. He didn't work because he wanted to. And I don't blame him. His heart wasn't in it. Now, Paul says, I'm sending him back to you. He's a believer. He's going to be profitable to you. But I don't want you to receive him as a slave whom I have sent again. Verse 12, I'm reading. And thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own heart. Just receive him as you do me, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. And I feel like saying, Paul, shame on you. Paul says, my first thought was, this man knew how to serve, and I need somebody. I'm in here in jail, and I'm in prison, and I'm old, and I think he was sick. He was cold. You remember, he asked for his cloak. He says, this fellow could help me. And my first thought, I'll keep him here and just let you know I got him. But he says, no, verse 14, but without thy mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. You know what Paul's saying? Paul is saying, I wouldn't keep him because that wouldn't be right. Although I thought of it. But if you want to send him back to me, that'll be all right. And I don't know this, but I think on the next boat going back to Rome, there was an estimate there going back with a whole lot of things for Paul the apostle. Now, will you notice? For perhaps... He therefore departed for a season that thou shouldst receive him forever. But now, not now as a servant, he's not coming back as a slave, but above a slave, a brother beloved. He's your brother now, especially to me, but how much more unto thee both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now we come to the two important verses, and I'm going to dwell on them in closing. Verse 17 says, If thou count me therefore partner, Receive him as myself. And then verse 18, If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee anything, put that on my account. You know, we think today that the credit card's something new. Paul had a credit card, by the way. You can buy anything today with a credit card. A gallon of gas to a 10-gallon hat, a meal to a chain of motels, a night lodging to a subdivision in California. There was in a restaurant It says, We take money, too. <laughs> They used credit cards. Well, Paul had a credit card because he was a believer in Christ. And he says here, he says, now look, if Onesimus ran away and if he stole something from you or did something wrong, you put it on my account, put it on my credit card. And then I want you, since you count me a partner, I want you to receive him just like you receive me. You always put me up in that guest room. Don't send him out yonder into the weather. You put him up in the guest room. My friend, may I say that back of this is something much more wonderful even than this. I hear the Lord Jesus Christ say, when I came to the Father for salvation, he says, if Vernon McGee hath wronged thee or oweth thee anything, put that on my account, because he paid the penalty of my sins on the cross. And then... He said to the Father, because I'm sure God the Father would have to say, well, that Father Vernon McGee's not fit for heaven. He says, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself in Christ today, accepted in the Beloved. Oh, what a picture this is of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the way he accepts you and the way that he accepts me today. Now, he goes on and says, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. And the Lord Jesus gave his life and shed his blood. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me, 
even thine own self. Besides, Paul had led him to the Lord, and he owed Paul a great deal. He says, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. And then he just concludes this here like this. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou will also do more than I say. Just some more surplus, you see. And that always is true of believers. The reason some of us are so poor today is because we have been so stingy with the Lord. The Lord's generous. We should be generous. Verse 22, At the same time, prepare me also a lodging. See, Paul expected to go there, and I think he did. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There, greet thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Somebody else in prison. Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And next time, friends, we go back to the Old Testament, to the book of Daniel.